So if you want high growth, you need bank credit creation for productive purposes. How are you going to get this? How did Japan do it? Um, I examined Bank of Japan and, um, well, central bank policy intervention. The standard tools the textbooks write about interest rates um, or quantity operations um, or reserve requirements turn out to be irrelevant. There was no story there. Um, but I continued my empirical research and I found out, oh, there's another tool not much talked about, um, window guidance, informal, extra-legal central bank guidance of bank credit, also known as directed credit. The central bank sets a quota for the banks, how much credit they're allowed to create. Not just allowed to create, but actually um, asked to create because it was a quota they were not allowed to overshoot or undershoot. Here's the window guides long growth quota. And I press the button, you see the actual bank lending more than three months later. And then you know that this is a very powerful control tool, and that's how you run the economy. Most central banks have used this in their history. It's developed in Germany by the Reichsbank 1912. The Fed has used it, the Bank of England has used it, Bank of Fra France has used it, uh, one of the German innovations that were kept uh, since 1941, de um, until the 1980s, officially in France even. Um, all the East, uh, East Asian economies have used it, Thailand, uh, India and so on. So we can have prosperity, we can have high growth, uh, we just need to make sure that uh, the economic system is run properly and at the core of this is the monetary system, as you can imagine, the creation and allocation of money and the best um, combination of policies is on the one hand, when you monitor this and make sure bank credit is not used for unproductive purposes, asset purchases that creates asset bubbles and, and banking crises or consumption uh, that creates um, inflation but is going into the green box of high growth if it's business investment for uh, new technologies implementation of um, new businesses SME lending small firm lending in particular um, tends to be very productive um, and secondly if you don't want the guidance or you can combine it, you can ensure that the banking system is designed so that the banks will always do this automatically. And that's when you have um, a decentralized banking system consisting of many small banks. Um, the structure of the banking system. If you have many, many small local banks, you will always get more bank credit for productive purposes. And when Deng Xiaoping came to power, he introduced the scientific principle and he decided to do some scientific research by going around to successful economies. He went to Japan first, and he managed to extract the secret of their high growth system. Window guidance, central bank guidance of bank credit. He introduced it straight away. They used the same expression, window guidance, uh, still to, until today at the People's Bank of China. And secondly, he dropped the Soviet system. The Soviet system was in, in the monetary arena to have essentially one bank. Goes bank, mono banking. That's what central plan planners love. That's what the globalists love, because it's centralized total control. But it's not very successful in economic terms. Uh, if you have a concentrated banking system with a small number of large banks, you only get large lending to large companies. But the small firms don't get money. You need small banks that lend to small firms, um, and you need a decentralized banking system. So, the UK only has five big banks. Most of their money is, most of the bank credit is for property or financial credit. So this is all credit for financial transactions. This is only 14% is for the real economy. Germany has been very successful because, and, and exports in Germany beating Chinese exporters until 2009, when actually, of course, the population economy is much, um, much smaller, but Germany ahead of China per capita um, way above China. Why? And the, a big chunk of German exports are due to small firms, family businesses, small firms owned by families that you don't know the name of. So the, the name is, is a bit hidden, but they're global champions in their top one, two, three market share. They're called hidden champions. If you do international, uh, international comparison, you'll find that um, there's more hidden champions in Germany than in any other country in the world. That's a way to have prosperity and abundance because these are family businesses, local small firms that are enabled to be global um, 
market share leaders. By what? Number two is the US, but there's a huge gap. And the explanation, of course, is the banking system. This is European countries and the number of banks in European countries. Which one sticks out? It's Germany. Why? Because 70% um, of deposits in Germany are with community banks, small local banks. 80% of all banks are small local community banks. Over 90% of SME lending is from such local banks. And that's what Japan, Korea, and Taiwan have, and that's what China introduced. So Deng Xiaoping started with one monobank and realized quickly, okay, okay, I, I get it. Scrap that. We're going to have banks. We're going to have a lot of banks. And he created small banks, community banks, savings banks, credit unions, regional banks, provincial banks. Now China has 4,500 banks just behind the US with 5,300 banks. Um, and so that's the secret to success. So that's what we have to aim for. That's what we should introduce. Then we can have prosperity for the whole world. And of course, developing countries don't need foreign money. They just need community banks and the local banking system supporting firms to have the money to get the latest technology, implement the latest technology, do capital investment. Um, now, in this context, what are the implications of central bank digital currencies? Well, we've been using digital currencies for ages. Bank digital currencies, BDC, has been around. And CBDC is just a PR way to hide, once again, the true story. So the simply current accounts offered by the central bank, it would mean that we all would have an account at the central bank. And there's ways of making this attractive to you, but it means that you are cutting out the banking system. And if there's a bit of a shock, where should you put your money? Well, okay, let's shift it to the central bank. This is a way to drastically speed up the centralization of banking systems that's already taking place. Under the ECB, 5,000 banks have disappeared. And it's not the Goldman Sachs banks that have disappeared. It's the small banks, community banks. 5,000 in those 22 years. Central banks are increasing concentration in banking systems. CBDCs will accelerate this dramatically until ultimately there's only one bank left, the central bank, and we have a Soviet monobank system. Because what we, what we see is the central bank, who's the bank regulator, saying, we're going to compete directly against the banks now. That's really what's happening. Well, what about fair competition? Well, if, if the government does it and the central bank does it, then suddenly all these rules about competition are out of the window. I mean, we know anyway that the anti-monopoly um, legislation has been very weak in, in most countries anyway. But this needs to be stopped because we're seeing the attempt to reintroduce the Soviet system. In many ways, of course, the European Union has been modeled on the Soviet Union with the um, European Commission being the Politburo, unelected, but the only source of newly uh, proposed laws. And the Soviet Union had a rubber stamp parliament. That's the European Parliament. They cannot, they do not propose new laws. That comes from the Politburo, the European Commission. But the idea seems to be to also now do that on the economic front. Um, we would therefore have only one bank left, the ECB. And what about economic growth? Well, that's it. No more growth for you guys. Sorry. No more prosperity. Oh, and here's the reason why we should do this. This is how they're trying to sell this to you. Well, we've got limits to growth. Growth is bad. You know, we're being told that, well, we need to degrowth. There should be zero growth. Is this actually true that economic growth is harmful for the environment? No, it's absolutely not true. There is absolutely no contradiction. And it's quite obvious. Think about it. <laughs> the fundamental reason is that actually there is no growth. In terms of physics, what is growth? It doesn't exist. It's an accounting fiction we've created by following certain accounting conventions. Can an accounting fiction hurt the environment? No. What hurts the environment is environmentally harmful things like pollution. And you can have lots of pollution with zero growth, trust me. So growth is not the enemy. Growth is the prosperity that we want to share with everyone. But 
there seems to be this plan out there to now stop growth by centralizing banking systems. And that's why we have to do the opposite, create small banks, local banks, community banks, um, so that we, we will ensure to have, um, that we have growth in our local communities. Um, in fact, the, the cooperative movement, which has been around for over 200 years, has been very successful and is really the, the source and basis for the German successful local community banking system. And the cooperative movement has the principle of self-organization, self-determination, self-responsibility, self-accountability, self-action, um, local self-action. You form groups on the local level and you take action, you, and of course they introduce laws to make this um, also legally very easy in Germany, and the legal situation is different in, in every country, um, but that was the idea and it's been very successful. The largest number of banks in Europe are cooperative banks, namely the Raiffeisen Volksbank banks in, in Germany, and that's a principle we should, um, we should remember and we can learn a lot from from our ancestors who, who worked hard to, to discover this and work out uh, these key principles. Cooperative companies, cooperative entities um, can be a very resilient way to organize an economy. Um, but in, in, in general, beyond the, the particular corporate structure is the principle of decentralization and delegating authority and decision-making as much to the lowest level as possible. And that's what we need, um, the principle of subsidiarity, which is, of course, reflected also in the cooperative movement. Um, I think I've slightly run over. I can just um, wrap up. Banking systems have become too concentrated. Central banks want to concentrate them even further uh, by introducing central bank digital currency. Uh, there's a lot of false narratives out there. Most of the things they tell us in economics are wrong. And if you want to find out, okay, so what's the real story here? The simple rule is, it's the opposite of what they tell you. <laughs> you will almost always be right. <laughs> And if we had time, and this is not just you know, um, a flippant comment, if we had time, I would give you at least 20 instances, very central cases where this can be demonstrated. So this is really a very reliable rule. Um, and I'm very much active trying to set up community banks. If you do that, you get um, a lot of benefits for the local community and for all the stakeholders involved. And they're, they're material benefits, and it materially changes the situation when you do that. Um, so, I set up local first community interest company to establish community banks. Um, we've been doing a lot of work in the UK where there's several community banks in the process of getting authorized, uh, but also now working in some other countries to establish community banks. Uh, if you're interested, get in touch. Some of my books, there's Princes of the End, which has more details, particularly on um, central bank um, uh, policy manipulation and how it affects government policies and even geopolitics. Thank you very much. Thanks for your attention.